from Australia, from Sydney. Sandra, what do you do? Okay, so I'm currently a Professor of Interpreting and Translation at the University of New South Wales. That's my full-time position. I am also the National President of OSIT, which is the National Professional Association for Interpreters and Translators in Australia. Um, I'm also um, a freelance interpreter. And that's three lives. That, that's right. three yeah, lives. Yeah, that's I'm a mother and a okay. wife. Okay, <laughs> good. Four lives. <laughs> right. Yeah, and many other things. But, yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're someone who's really bridging uh, the profession and academic that's research. That's right, yes. And policy, I guess. And policy, yes. In, yes. in Aussie. I've been heavily involved um, not only with uh, interpreting and translation practitioners, but also with um, especially the, the judiciary. So um, uh, in trying to raise awareness about um, interpreting, uh, teaching the judiciary how to work with interpreters. And, so you're giving uh, training, courses training courses to, to judges. judges and yeah, magistrates, right. tribunal members, uh, sometimes lawyers. Um, and also um, more recently collaborating in research with them. Uh, and um, just now also uh, collaborating in a, a big project to establish national standards for court interpreting in Australia, yeah. which will impinge not only on what interpreters do, because that's something that we've always been doing, but on what the uh, judicial system mm -hmm. should do to accommodate interpreters, including giving them adequate working conditions, adequate briefings, etc., etc. So that, that will be a, a huge breakthrough. Can you tell us something about the what seems incredible institutionalization of the professions in Australia. You've got Nati, you've got Ozit. Mm -hmm. You've got two things happening there. Yes. You're involved in one, yes. but you did a review of the other. Yes, so yes. How, did, right. how, how does that yeah. work in Australia? Uh, two very different <coughs> things. Um, Nati is the independent standard setting body. So Nati accredits interpreters and translators at different levels mm. of competence. Okay, so it's the NAAT. Right, That's right, right. The National Accreditation Authority for Translators and Interpreters. Yeah. They also approve university degrees or TAFE courses. Uh, Ta so TAFE, TAFE is, is technical and further education yeah. um, uh, technical degree. Uh, sorry, diplomas or advanced diplomas. Uh, so they approve them to offer uh, programs that uh, when the students graduate, if they meet all the requirements, they are NATI accredited at the various levels. Um, so that's NATI. Uh, OSIT is a member-based professional association. Mm. So the practitioners pay a fee, an annual fee, to become members. So they're, they're two very different things. So um, obviously we all, and now that I'm president of OSIT, we're trying to all work together. This is one of my aims, to try and get everybody working together collaboratively to achieve the same goals, mm -hmm. rather than you know work independently and sometimes against each other. <laughs> so yes. Who owns Nati? Uh, Nati is owned by um, uh, the different state governments mm. and the Commonwealth government. Who's the major client for translators and interpreters? The major client, uh, well, I suppose the public service. Mm -hmm. um, so the courts will probably be the major clients. Okay and the hospitals. Mm. So Australia, especially in New South Wales, um, New South Wales has a very good uh, health interpret service. Yeah. Um, so that's um, run by the uh, by the hospitals. Mm. Okay, so mm. that, that's what... No, I'm just interested that the government is involved in certification. Yes. And in employment. Right. Yes. The employer is setting the yes. professional standards. To an extent. A, and, and from from these, the outside. Yes, it, yes. It to, like these that. national standards that we're working on uh, have the aim of... of improving that you know because mm. at the moment uh, the levels of remuneration are not that great uh, the working conditions are not that great obviously you know if you compare it to other countries they're probably very good but mm. um, uh, you know after 30 years it's time to move on so everything is going through a state of change and improvement Nati has been through a, a big review which I led a number of years ago and now they're going through uh, the implementation of the recommendations. Mm -hmm. So things will, will look uh, a bit different in a few years and, and much better in my opinion. Okay. Mm. Let's go back to your mid early mid-twenties. <laughs> uh, I should point out you're, you're originally from Argentina. From Argentina, that's so. right. So yes, I um, uh, my parents migrated to Australia when I was 12, 13. Um, as I was telling you, a very difficult time of my life, mm. uh, entering puberty, not knowing any English, uh, and going through all that um, uh, period of transition, 
learning English in high school. So I have the experience of being uh, in, the, in the field that I am, I've had the first-hand experience of every perspective. Of being on the other side. So, yeah, of, so I've yes, been yeah. on the side of the non-English speaking migrant yeah. who couldn't mm. understand anything and who thought, uh, so, who was um, thought to be uh, less than <laughs> because I couldn't speak English. So, you know. And they think you're, that, you're yeah, not think intelligent. You're stupid, yeah, right, they think yeah. you're stupid yeah. because you can't speak English. So, you know, feeling um, uh, insecure. And as I was saying yesterday, you know, that, that's given me this uh, resilience to, to, to prove them wrong and to, to keep moving yeah. and to keep improving. So I've been on that side. I've been also on the side of helping my mum in particular mm. uh, when she had to go and do dealings with You were a child interpreter? Uh, yeah, right? a bit of a child yeah. interpreter. I wouldn't call myself interpreter, you know, right, just yeah. helping out. Okay. But um, that um, also, you know, opened my eyes to the need for interpreters. Mm. Um, so I've been on, on all the sides. I've been on, obviously, uh, being a student of interpreting uh, and then being an interpreter. So wh so. where did you study interpreting? Okay, so I, um, I studied interpreting at the MacArthur Institute of Higher Education. Uh, when I finished high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I went to an information session and um, this new program, the first ever degree mm -hmm. in interpreting and translation, was being advertised. So I was in the first cohort mm -hmm. of that uh, so Bachelor that, of Arts in Interpreting Sydney. and Translation mm -hmm. in Sydney, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, and then uh, that institution became the uh, University of Western Sydney. So I did my first degree there, then my um, education uh, qualification there as well. Then I studied elsewhere, um, everything else. Um, but I went back to Argentina as well to um, to do some translation training okay. as well. But you were at the University of Western Sydney for a long yes, time. Yes, so when I came yeah. back from Argentina after doing some uh, further training, uh, I came back, or I went back to Australia, and I was invited to do some casual teaching, so some mm. hours. Um, so I, I, I did that, uh, and I continued to work as an interpreter and translator freelance. Uh, and sometime after that, um, uh, a position came up, full-time position as a, an academic a, a trainer. Um, and it was difficult for me to make that decision, you know, whether mm. to uh, stay. I, I really enjoyed working as a freelance interpreter and translator. I loved the freedom of choosing what I wanted mm. to do and so on. Uh, but then I decided, okay, I had to decide whether to go for that position or forego that position, someone else will get it, and then maybe I wouldn't have that chance could, again. Could you combine the two? So Do what I did, I, I took up, the, you know, went for the position. I was lucky enough to get it, the full-time position. So I became full-time academic, part-time mm -hmm. uh, practitioner. Yeah. And I believe that I've been able to do a lot more uh, work, you know, help a lot more in the development of the profession, in improving the profession, from being an academic yeah. uh, than if I had stayed as a practitioner. But, so, no, but you're also speaking as a practitioner. When you but, uh, speak to practitioners, that's you're right. one of, that's one right, of them. Because I'm yeah. still also a practitioner. Yeah. So, yeah. yes, yeah. So, so I can see it from, from all angles. Okay. And research came uh, later because it was just a teaching uh, position first. Uh, research uh, came later. I did a master's and then a PhD uh, to answer practical questions. Questions Good, that I yeah. had as a practitioner that yeah. had not been answered before. And so I did uh, my research in court interpreting. Uh, and it was one of the first, um, well, the first PhD in court interpreting in Australia, one of the first around the world, um, using authentic data, mm -hmm. uh, naturally occurring data in the courts. So I collected a lot of, um, of data that way. Uh, and that led to you know everything else that I've mm -hmm. been doing since. You since moved to the University of New South Wales. Yes, so in 2011, after 20 years at um, University of Western Sydney, I moved to the University of New South Wales with a newer program. Um, and yes, and um, we we teach at the postgraduate level, so uh, a lot of things are happening there. Vibrant program now. Yeah. Can you say a few words about translator training and translation research in Australia? Okay, so uh, we have a number of universities around the country that have uh, programs that are approved by NATI, so that, that means that they have a professional orientation. Then we have others that have more of a academic um, orientation or research orientation, but not necessarily approved by NATI, and some of the technical colleges that also teach. Uh, so we've got um, uh, diploma, advanced diploma, undergraduate and bachelor's degree, and postgraduate masters, and then a number of PhDs. Um, we don't have what you call PhD programs uh, in other You just parts. do the we, thesis. We have, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So uh, supervisors work uh, with the uh, PhD students to, to get them to the final. There are a surprising number of programs 
Yes. There you know, are. In a lot of languages. Mm, mm, that's right. A, num a, a surprising number because it's, it's, you know, the population is not that big, but yeah. it, it, because Australia is so big geographically, um, distance education hasn't right. taken up yet. So uh, most of the courses um, are you know, based at the different campuses. Um, the main focus has been, from the time I graduated, from the first degrees, on community interpreting. Mm. Translation is more... You know, yeah. homogenous, but community interpreting has been the main yeah. uh, interpreting um, training. But uh, more recently, from the late 90s onwards, uh, with all introduced conference interpreting training yeah. as well, and the, the demand for conference interpreting I think has increased yeah. a lot in Australia too. More conferences are being held in Australia, yeah. so yeah, so yeah. we've got the whole gamut. Yeah. yeah, what kind of research do you think is needed? Um, I was thinking about this in the previous um, session that um, a lot of the research that has been done has been to pinpoint the mistakes, the, the difficulties, the problems, particularly in, in interpreting and particularly in community interpreting. So a lot of the research shows what untrained interpreters do. Mm. Um, but And the, the poor status of the profession and so on. Very few research has been done to show what good interpreters do, <laughs> <laughs> okay. and what you know how we can learn from the good strategies right. that interpreters uh, um, adopt, That's uh, true, and true. and the, the good interpreters who feel appreciated and who work well with other professionals. And I think, and I've done a bit of that myself. Mm. I've got one article uh, which is called "The Other Side of the Coin: The Positive Side of Community Interpreting," uh, and I think um, more needs to be done on that. Now, I've yeah. also done research recently on the difference between trained and untrained interpreters. Uh, to show how training does help uh, and Good. how what seems to be the undoable uh, when you look at untrained interpreters is actually very doable when you yeah. looked at when you look at the trained ones. Okay. So yeah, I think long term training, short term training. Yeah, well, I mean, that's another thing. Uh, another area yeah, of research okay. that is needed is what type of training is effective. Yeah. yeah. So okay. how long, what content, because training is not just one thing, you know. Yeah. So they're very different. Some training may be useless. So you have, to, you know, good, uh, yeah. a good research area would be the effectiveness of training, how yeah. to do it, and so on. Yeah. There's a widespread pessimism mm. about all aspects of the translation profession, but mm. particularly community, mm. particularly in Yes, yes. Is that warranted, or is it time for... Uh, it's, a more optimistic yeah, I mean, I'm there. an optimistic person, otherwise okay. I would have given up a long right, time yeah. ago. <laughs> so I think, yes, I can understand why a lot of people are pessimistic about it, because the rate of pay, the, the um, uh, working conditions uh, are not in, on a par with other professions. Uh, especially when you have been trained and you see, well, you know, where is the... Um, uh, the benefits of having trained for three years, four years, or whatever it is. Mm. Uh, so I understand it. But on the other hand, I see in the span of over 30 years that I've been involved in this, I have seen the improvements. You know, mm. I have seen the way that uh, other professionals have uh, become more aware yeah. of the role of the interpreter, of how to work with interpreters, um, of the necessity having interpreters and you know all of this work that I've been doing with the judges has paid off I remember in one of the um, one of the uh, more, more recent studies that I've done where I've gone and observed courts around Sydney uh, with interpreters and I went to one particular court where there was one magistrate who had been trained in one of my sessions and a trained interpreter and everything worked beautifully you know, they worked together extremely well. Okay. The magistrate respected the interpreter, asked the interpreter questions. The interpreter, when she needed clarifications, stopped and asked for clarifications. Everything else then ran smoothly. When there was a challenge from one of the lawyers who spoke the same language as the interpreter, the magistrate gave the interpreter the opportunity to, to reply. Okay. So right. I thought, so this is excellent. You could sign you that. Know? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's Tick. Okay. Well <laughs> so, you know, that's what I'm saying. You can see a lot of good examples okay. like this. Obviously, not everybody has been trained, not everybody is aware, and new people will come all the time. Another strategy that we're using at, at um, my university, University of New South Wales, is to train the students. So we're working closely with the law students. We do oh, right, trials yes, with the, okay. with the uh, law students yep. and the interpreting students and with the medical students. We mm. do mock consultations and we train them how to work with interpreters Great. so they learn from each other. And, um, you know, if you can train them before they go out, then uh, your battle is half won. Okay. Mm.
Sandra, thank you very much. Thank you for interviewing yeah. me. <laughs>